Well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, three things that I'll say before we get started. One is, I know it's a small group, so I will not be offended if you need to step out at some point. Don't feel bad about it. Uh, secondly, I do have actual proceedings, notes for this. If anybody's interested, feel free to give me your email afterwards. I'm happy to email it to you. The, the notes for this are quite comprehensive and more academic, but if you're interested in the science behind all this stuff, I'm happy to share it. And um, finally, any questions you have, feel free to shout them out during, after, whatever, whatever you like. So I'm Dr. Shadia Rafich. We're gonna be talking about canine hyperthermia slash heat stroke first, and then we'll talk about hypothermia afterwards. So a little bit about me. I graduated from Cornell University as a veterinarian in 2006. I did my one year internship at Angel Memorial, which is a hospital in Boston. After that, I did two surgical internships and a three year surgical residency in Long Island at Long Island Veterinary Specialists. I then moved uh, out west from New York and worked at a specialty hospital here in town, followed by managing three hospitals in Silicon Valley, and then became part owner of a hospital in Los Angeles before moving back out here and starting my uh, online company, Vet Triage. This is the outline. We're going to go over some definitions regarding hyperthermia, heat stroke, the different types, the incidence, how to measure body temperatures. We'll talk about the symptoms associated with the disease, testing that we have in the veterinary field for this condition, treatment, outcome, prognosis, prevention, and then a summary, and of course, any questions you have. So we'll start off with the definition. Uh, hyperthermia, by definition, is an ab elevated abnormality in thermometer and temperature. And so when you look at hyperthermia, you want to differentiate between that and having an actual fever. So hyperthermia is an elevated body temperature, whereas a fever is a change in the thermal regulation of the brain that monitors the body temperature, two different things. So that's important because we end up seeing with these dogs that have an elevated temperature, which is defined as being over 105.8, that's really high, but that's how we define it for hyperthermia or heat stroke. The, the downstream sequela to the patient's body, which we call systemic inflammatory response syndrome in both dogs and cats is what we see in the hospital. So heat stroke is not just a high temperature, we need to deal with it, it has actually multi-organ systemic effects to it. And so some of the parameters we'll use to decide whether or not this patient is undergoing SIRS as a result of heat stroke is a chart like this. So with dogs, for example, you're looking at elevated temperatures, obviously, you may wonder, well, why is there a low temperature for heat stroke or hyperthermia? Well, SIRS is related to any disease. And so depending on what the disease process is, you'll notice the inflammatory reactions in their body from whatever disease. But SIRS is a manifestation of heat stroke or hyperthermia. We're looking for abnormalities in heart rate, respiratory rate, and then on blood work, what's their white blood cell count level like, and then the number of band cells, which are specific types of, of uh, immature neutrophils, a, a specific type of white blood cell. Anyway, so, so this is a criteria that we use in the hospital, but in the field, if you have, if you have the ability to uh, at least measure body temperature, heart rate, and of course, most can count respiratory rate, well, you're already, you're already part of the way there with figuring out whether or not this dog is, is suffering from something, suffering from the downstream sequela of, of heat stroke or hyperthermia. So here are the definitions of, of these two terms. Uh, hyperthermia, an increase in body temperature above the normal range due to abnormal and unregulated heat loss, heat gain, heat production, and the hypothalamus set point is unaltered. So this is where the amount of heat that a dog is experiencing is, is more than the amount of heat they can give off. So that imbalance causes your standard heat strokes. That's your dog stuck in the, in the car or playing too hard outside. Fever. Any, a particular form of hyperthermia in which heat loss and heat gain mechanisms are adjusted to maintain body temperature at a, uh, at a higher hypothermic set point, so it's called regulated hyperthermia, due to infection, inflammation, etc. So in the body, again, not related to environment, in the body, if there's a stimulus, most often like bacterial infections or viral infections, pyrogens, which are a class of proteins in the body that affect the, the thermoregulatory system of the brain, that'll, that'll, these 
mediators will go to the brain and change the hypothalamic set point. And so your regular baseline for your body temperature, so for us 98.6, for dogs 100 to 102.5, um, that's now changed. It's set up higher, and that's to combat fever. That's what the body's, one of the body's mechanisms to help fight infections and, infl and inflammatory diseases, immune diseases, cancer. But so fever is different than hyperthermia. So obviously this talk is focused on hyperthermia because you're out in the field, your dogs are working, and so, so that's what we're focusing on here. So this is just a picture of the, the brain here where the thermal regulation occurs. This is true in people as well. In fact, this is a, a person's brain. But if you zoom in on the hypothalamus, this thing that looks like a scrotum is a pituitary gland, which is involved in the endocrine system of the body. Multiple hormones are regulated by the, by the pituitary gland. Right above it, at the base of the brain, is the hypothalamus where thermoregulation occurs. So now you have different types of heat stroke. And the classical or environmental heat stroke is due to the temperature being too high outside and the dog becomes overheated. And that, that, that accounts for about a third of these cases that we see. Exertional are those dogs that are playing too hard. We all have those dogs that are just nonstop. They don't, they don't have an off switch, right? And a lot of your working dogs are in that class. They're just, they're just, they're just animals. And so two thirds of the dogs that become hyperthermic are from exertional. I mean, there are these dogs that can handle 105, 106 temperatures, whereas in a normal dog, a non-working dog, they'd be in a coma from that type of temperature. And so it just depends on the, on the biology of the, of the patient and their lifestyle. And of course, you can have a combination of the two things as well. So this is something that we see often in the clinic. And it's a hot summer day, it's humid, the dog comes in, uh, 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 borderline comatose, and one of the rule outs is, is this dog have hypothermia or any other myriad of diseases. So uh, we typically will see this obviously through the warmer months. Uh, typically in the studies that we, that we know, we see it usually in the afternoon. And of course, being in a car is a risk factor as well. These aren't necessarily your working dogs, but the dogs that have the squished in faces are at risk, right? Because they can't dissipate heat. They are born with smaller mouths, larger tongues. Their skulls are dome shaped. They have smaller nares. Their nasal cavity is squished. All the mechanisms that dogs normally use to give off heat these guys don't have it. And so brachycephalic dogs are predisposed to overheating. Dogs that are also larger are prone to overheating as well. Those dogs that are over 50 kilograms, 110 pounds, are at risk also. And a, common, a, a good example of like a brachycephalic dog that weighs as much as like a pit bull. They're considered brachycephalic and they are on the larger side as well. So those are your risk factors that we know of. The, Death rate, this is a study that was done in the United Kingdom, in the UK, 2016. Uh, hy hyperthermia or heat stroke accounts for 0.04% death rate. And the total event fatality, we look at all diseases in that study. I think it was almost like a million dogs in that study. Almost 15% fatality from heat stroke. Oh. So when you look at, at working dogs and you look at death rates in regards to, to dogs that are out there risking their lives for our safety, the, the death and euthanasia rate from hyperthermia, usually the sequela to it is about 25%. Usually, depending on the study, this is in the top three of reasons why working dogs succumb. Uh, the other two things are um, vehicular accidents, that's number one, and then typically two or three becomes like a projectile trauma and so so heat strokes up there and you know of course you know if you're if you're uh, working in desert environments and you have these dogs that are that are constantly on the go yeah that's that's something that's gonna it's gonna happen uh, US military owned uh, military working dog that died while deployed in Iraq or Afghanistan in 2001 2013 the um, heat stress in those dogs the frequency was about 10 percent and so that's what, or rather the, uh, the, the injury of these dogs is 10%, the, the percentage of heat related issues are much higher. So, and the reason why we're, we're focusing on this is because it's so common and also because it's preventable. So that's, that's, the, that's the goal here, is if you can prevent this condition from occurring, then it's better off for the, for the canines. When you look at how to check body temperatures in dogs, this is again from the medical literature. A normal adult dog should be 
between 100 degrees Fahrenheit and 102.5. There's some variation depending on the dog's individual body, but that's typically the range. Younger dogs, so puppies, are usually 100 or less. The, if you look at studies that go based on just feeling the nose, is it a wet nose or a hot nose or whatever, it's, there's no correlation between that and rectal temperature. And by the way, rectal temperature is the gold standard. Getting a rectal thermometer and checking rectally is what you, what the ideal way of measuring temperature is. Not every dog's okay with that, of course, and you have to have a digital thermometer at, uh, at hand. That's the gold standard. So just touching the nose is not accurate. If you look at the, the, the ear thermometers in dogs, because of anatomic, anatomic variations, we find that there's not a great correlation between rectal thermometer measurements and uh, the ear. So um, these also, although they're not bad, I mean, it's better than nothing if you, if you have to, but they're not, they don't correlate very well. We also find, by the way, speaking of risk factors, um, male dogs are at risk and those with dark hair coats. Dark hair coats, obviously, because of the, ability, the inability to reflect sun back, right, if they're outside in the sun. Males, because they're the ones that are being worked most often, they have the, they have the larger body size, they're a bit more aggressive, and so males are predisposed. Um, okay, and then, and then finally, the, probably the second best tool will be axillary, so under the arm, the armpit. If you take a digital thermometer and stick it under the armpit and add about a degree or two to that, that's roughly the rectal thermometer uh, measurement. So that's, that's a, that's, you still need a rectal thermometer, you still need a thermometer to do this. Um, these days digital, I don't think they make mercury anymore, but, but that's how you would check for axillary. The infrared things that you stick on the forehead, those also are not that great. Um, you can use it, they're inconsistent though, and there's a poor correlation with rectal. But I, I've used that in settings where on a vet triage, for example, if a patient, if there's a pet at home with a problem and they have an infrared one, I'll have them just shoot it and see, who cares? There's no side effect to it, it's easy. Um, but because of the, of the variation in hair thickness and dermal and subcutaneous thickness in dogs versus people, they're just not accurate. Okay, so symptoms. So because it's a, it's a systemic multi-organ condition, it's gonna affect multiple parts of the body, focusing on cardiovascular, and if you remember from that surge chart in the beginning, we had heart rate as one of those factors. The nervous system, central nervous system, so that dog that we had in the picture that was kind of comatose slash uptundant, that's gonna be affected as well. And then the ability to form or not form blood clots is a problem, so hemostatic dysfunction. So these dogs show up most of the time with collapse, they're in shock, they may have seizures, mentation changes, um, a fast respiratory rate, fast heart rate, and then gastrointestinal signs. The, the shock organ in dogs is the, is the GI tract, and so you'll end up seeing uh, uh, diarrhea from these dogs because of, of shock. When we look at blood work for these, for these affected animals, if you look at their complete blood counts so the CBC, they usually have low, low platelets. Low platelets comes in four different categories. Either you're not making enough, which is not the case here. You're, they're being used up more than you're replacing them, which can be the case here. You're losing them somewhere, like with hemorrhage, not really the case here. Um, or they're being destroyed by something, which may or may not be the case here. Usually this is probably a consumption problem. They're being used up because of the abnormalities and being able to form clots effectively, which is the secondary effects of having heat stroke. But anyway, low platelets, and so they can't form clots that well. One of the biggest prognostic factors and biomarkers we use are nucleated red blood cells. So this is a normal red blood cell. You can see it's smooth, there's no nucleus in there. And then this is a nucleated red blood cell. You can see it has pigment in the cytoplasm and the nucleus is present. What this represents, these nucleated red blood cells, and you see that in 58 to 95% of these dogs is the body's pumping out red blood cells faster than the normal process. So they're going out immature. They're just immature red blood cells in the bloodstream. The body's trying to fix the problem that it's dealing with. So we find it to be somewhat prognostic or at least tell you how severely affected these dogs are. The higher the nuclear red blood cell count, the more severe they are. But at the same time, the better the prognosis. So we use that to try and prognosticate Polycythemia is an elevated red blood cell count, which you would expect if you're pumping out nuclear red blood cells, you'll have a higher red blood cell count. Increased hemoglobin, which is a side effect of having more red blood cells. And then if you look at their ability to form clots, 
their, the time it takes for them to form a clot is elevated, which is expected. If they don't have platelets, they're not being able to form clots, the elevations, the time will be evident on blood work. And so these dogs will have, uh, will have abnormalities there as well. Treatment, as you can imagine, from all these facts we're talking about is case specific. And of course, beyond what we're gonna talk about here, other than basic parameters, especially what you may be able to do in the field, what you have around you. The, the, the main parameters here with these dogs is symptomatic treatment to get in, in order to help fight the secondary effects of hyperthermia and of course get the body temperature down. Simply lowering the body temperature is not enough. You have to be able to take care of the entire body as a whole. So we end up, we end up having a multi-therapeutic approach to this. Oxygen supplementation, cooling the pets, intravenous fluid therapy, uh, gastrointestinal for those dogs that are having issues with shock, um, anti-vomiting, and antibiotics. The reason, by the way, for antibiotics, especially these days where we are very aware of the overuse of antibiotics, is because the gastrointestinal tract in dogs is the shock organ, if the GI tract gets hit from a severe condition like hyperthermia or heat stroke, then the bacteria that live in the gut now get free range to go through the GI tract into the bloodstream and there's, that's how you get septicemia, sepsis. So you're, you're doing this because maybe the dogs have signs of infection on your laboratory test, most often as a preventative measure because bacterial translocation from the GI tract is a common sequela of shock in general, whether it's heat stroke or something else, that's why you'd have my antibiotics. So, so this is the most important part of all this, of course, because if you're in the field and your dog is overheated, you want to cool them. And the, the, the biggest takeaway from the hyperthermia portion of this talk is make sure you're monitoring temperatures while you're trying to cool them. You can overshoot it. So I usually tell people, when you hit about 103.5, stop cooling them. Dry them off, take off the fans, whatever, take away the ice cubes, whatever it is. Once you hit about 103.5, you don't want to overshoot it and you have another problem. So, so um, I've had pet owners, unfortunately, you know, uh, not help the situation, let's say, because they are trying to cool the dogs at home unregulated. They're not monitoring anything. So now you have a hypothermic patient that was already in shock from hyperthermia. That's a mess. And it's, a, it's, a, it's not going not gonna to go well with that, that dog. So when you look at studies, and these are the, some of the things I have in the more comprehensive notes, there was a study that looked at cooling off these dogs with either natural cooling, so it's kind of let them cool off, took about 48 minutes to get back to normal temperature using a, a flooring, a cooling mat, took about 36 minutes, or immersion in water, about 16 minutes. And this water is pretty warm, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember, dogs run a little bit hotter than we do. So, so a hotter, a warmer water temperature for them is gonna feel cooler to them than, than to us. So, so this was, of course, the fastest. So the takeaway from this is make sure the dogs have access to water, obviously. But it shows that if you're trying to cool them, Actively cooling them in like a water bath is more effective than a mat or just letting them cool off on their own. Another study looked at giving them water, free range tap water versus water that has this nutrient supplement. It's a combination of like amino acids and electrolytes. They wouldn't specify in the paper what product it was. Um, um, I, I don't know, but anyway, a nutrient enriched water. And then they compared the, the dog's parameters, the temperature and the pulse rate. And it turns out that if you have a nutrient-enriched water available, the dogs prefer that over regular tap water. And that kind of makes sense. The body's telling them we're missing all these electrolytes. The body's inclination is to say, hey, that water's got the thing I need, and then they're going to drink it there. So takeaway there is if you guys have access to anything like this, electrolytes in the field, or some sort of replacement therapy beyond just water, the dogs will prefer that. Their body needs that. Recovering these dogs in the hospital setting can take hours to days, and the average duration is one to six, or rather the range is one to six days. Uh, most dogs go home in like two or three days, somewhere around there. And, and this is because some of them come in really debilitated from, from the condition. So for example, kidney, kidney failure, kidney insult is very common for these dogs. And this also contributes to having low platelets, is actually a reason for, for having a, uh, a loss of platelets is from kidney disease because the clots, the proteins that you need to form clots in the body get, get filtered through the kidney. They get filtered more if the kidney is abnormal. And if you're losing those proteins, you can't form clots. You can't form clots, you lose all your platelets that are trying to form clots, and then you end up having low platelet counts. Anyway, the kidney is just another organ that gets infected by this besides central nervous system, cardiovascular, GI tract. 
Overall survival is 50 to 60 percent. Again, this is in the hospital setting. Mortality is about 50 percent. Kidney disease in these dogs, uh, mortality associated with that. So this is a yeah, it's a multi-systemic problem and uh, can be quite detrimental to them. Prognosis. So, if you're trying to if you're if you're trying to figure out wh which one of these dogs will make it, which ones won't, the prognosis depends on a few factors. Those dogs that uh, are in the hospital for 12 hours are more likely to die than those that are in the hospital for 60 hours. That kind of makes sense. If a dog is showing signs of getting better, they're going to be in the hospital longer. If they're showing signs of needing a ventilator because they're in a coma and they can't breathe on their own, they have multi-organ failure or whatever it is, those dogs tend not to stay in the hospital that long. They either die or get euthanized. So it's one extreme or the other. So the longer they can stay in the hospital, the better off they're going to be. Most are end up dying or being euthanized in a day or two. This is the nuclear red blood cells we talked about earlier. If they have them, um, the dogs are more likely to be alive after three days. Those that are, that, that are less likely to survive have multiple blood panel arrangements. We didn't go over this because a lot of it is nuanced, but things like protein levels and cholesterol get off the charts um, in either direction because these dogs have multiple organs that are being affected from this, from this condition. If they have ventricular arrhythmia, so they have a heart arrhythmia, they're more likely to not survive. Other factors for not surviving, if they're older, if they present with a high, a fast heart rate, which again is part of SIRS, we talked about that earlier. If they have hyperthermia, obviously. If they're obese, because they can't give off the heat as much. And obesity has multiple systemic effects. If there's over a one and a half hour lag time to get to the hospital after the stroke started, that's a problem. And if they come into you comatose on presentation, that's a problem. And a lot of these, of course, are probably just common sense. You know, it makes sense. But those are the factors that we see in the, in the literature. Again, you're trying, to, you're trying to determine, like, with these dogs, you know, how much does a pet owner or a dog owner put a dog through? If you're looking at, you know, ten to twenty thousand dollars of intensive care uh, for a dog that's got a that's got a lot of these factors, that helps you make your decision as far as whether or not you're going to dive into that. So that's why this, that prognosis matters. Prevention, prevention is key. So um, pre-exercise hydration was tried where they offer dogs uh, water by mouth, chicken flavored water, and then it, it turns out that just like the electrolyte study, the nutrient electrolyte study, the dogs that had access to chicken flavored preferred it, so they drank more water. They also compared it to giving subcutaneous electrolyte solutions. I don't know how often you have injectables like this in the field, or but yeah, so so if you're trying to find something that's that's easy to administer in a dog that's able to drink, like neurologically able to drink, then flavoring the water with something, again, proves to be beneficial. And then, uh, yeah, and then this is a continuation of the study. So, so just a matter of stressing the point that prevention is key. Have um, uh, troughs with water in them for dogs if you need to immerse them. Have water available, ideally supplemented with some sort of electrolyte solution or nutrient solution. So water troughs, water in the field water troughs for treatment in the field. These are the things that they that people use have access to at home. So if you play, if you spray alcohol on their on their paw pads, right, that'll lower their temperature as well. Again, remember not to overshoot it. You want to monitor the thermometer, rectal thermometers while you're doing all this, because you can't overshoot it. Bathing them in cold water, having fans on them, always check the body temperature using a thermometer. In fact, if you suspect your dog has heat stroke, first thing you do is confirm it with the temperature. Make sure, because dogs can be acutely debilitated in a coma for many reasons, not just heat stroke. Even though, even though you were just outside with a dog that was playing hard and most likely it's gonna be heat stroke, confirm it, get a thermometer. If you start off cooling a dog and then check a thermometer afterwards, we have no idea, I mean, are we treating the right thing? How much of a difference did we make, you know? Um, if your dog was, was showing signs of heat stroke with a temperature of 105, it takes a lot less cooling, a lot less aggressive cooling for that dog versus something that's 1075, 108. That you want to treat aggressively. But you want to have a baseline so you know that what you're treating is actually what you're treating. So in conclusion, for hyperthermia, the normal body temperature for dogs is 100 to 102.5. Prevention is having access to water. And then always check the body temperature to avoid uh, overcooling. This is my, my contact information here. This is a, a QR code for my, my website. 
And if you have any questions, I'll take them now. If you want to have the, the, the notes to this, the actual handouts, I'm happy to email them to you. Maybe just uh, uh, connect with me on one of these platforms or shoot me an email and, and I'll be happy to share with you the, the documents. Any questions regarding hyperthermia before we talk about hypothermia? Yes? Can you expand the dog's endurance in a hotter environment? Mm -hmm. So the question is, can you extend the dog's endurance in hotter environments? Absolutely. Yeah, these, these dogs are sort of bred for this type of thing, the German Shepherds and Malinois. They, they, are, they just run on a different battery, man. And, and you can change their hypothalamic thermal regulation system if, you, if they are conditioned to work like that. Another good example are sled dogs, like the Alaskan sled dogs too. These dogs are powerhouses when it comes to being able to use every single source of nutrients in their body, their caloric intake, for what they had to do with sled racing. So absolutely, you can, they, can, they can get accustomed to or get used to a higher environment. And I think that's probably why the hyperthermia definition of over 105.8, which is insanely high, is probably there. Because a lot of the dogs that we see that are in this situation are either the dogs that just can't breathe well because they're pugs and bulldogs, whatever, or the working dogs that are like, that normally run at like 104, 104, five. So, yes? With the alcohol, um, what we got from animal control was that they just pour it in your hand, pour it on the bed, pour it on their bellies, go through your vet. Um, with that, is it spray better, or because we just have the bottles that pour them? So the question is, is there a difference between spraying the alcohol on their pad versus putting it on your own hands and, and putting it on the dog? I don't care either way. It doesn't matter to me. Um, I, that's an, an important point, though, is, is going to the vet. So the, I'm not advocating necessarily that you're treating heat stroke out in the field on your own. If you have access to a veterinarian, then yes. Check the body temperature, confirm it, start cooling them, and then go to the vet, right? This, the scenario I'm giving you here where it's like you're stuck you have no access to care, these are things that you would do to try and, and combat this. But yeah, I don't, I don't care either way. The other problem with alcohol is that it evaporates really quickly. And the, part of the reason for the cooling, I think, is it, it allowing it to evaporate. If you already put it on your hands, it's already starting to evaporate, now you're losing the benefit of it. So probably spraying is better, but whatever, whatever you can do. If you, all you have is a bottle with no spray nozzle, then sure, open it up and, and pour it on them. Yeah. Yeah. But, but again, keep in mind too, once you're done cooling them, you hit that 103.5 mark, then you gotta dry them off. Get the alcohol off them and, and, and stop the cooling process. Yes? The efficiency of cooling vest? What was that? The efficiency of cooling vest? Of a cooling vest? Yeah. Yeah, that I don't know. So the question is, um, uh, what about the efficiency of a cooling vest? I, I don't know. We have um, data from the hypothermia side that we'll talk about that that does help. You can retain heat in those dogs. But I, I would imagine that a cooling vest would help, but I don't know, because the question is, do you use it during activity? Do you use it as a cooling mechanism afterwards? And then are there are there products out there, you may know, that, that are like that for dogs? But yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, don't, I didn't, couldn't find any studies on that anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. The only thing I'd be warning with, with any kind of tactile warming or cooling system is, again, uh, because dogs won't complain during the process. So if it's too cold, and you're da it's damaging their skin, then um, they might not tell you until it's too late or until you see it. It's the same thing with heating pads. You can overdo it if you don't uh, keep a barrier between the dog's body and the heating pad. So as long as, those, and again, I assume these products are, are tested and made for dogs, as long as there's no risk of like freeze or burn, then, then uh, it'd be interesting to see if they have any studies on that in the future. Any other questions? All right, hypothermia. So, definition of hypothermia is having a body temperature in dogs of less than 98.6. Um, so we just talked about hyperthermia. So this is kind of more realistic. Most of us in the vet office, if you're above a 103 temperature, we're considering that a fever or hyperthermia, one of the two. Normal body temperature, 100 to 102.5 to 103. Uh, slight hypothermia, 97 degrees, moderate, 93, severe, less than 93. When you start hitting towards these numbers, I mean, 97, usually there's dogs under anesthesia, uh, you know, so beyond that, they're really in trouble. Uh, hypothermia type, so they can relate to broad factors. One is disease. So any disease, doesn't matter. Pick one and uh, low temperature can be manifestation of it. Something like kidney disease, which we see in 
um, a third of cats and a quarter of dogs that can cause it heart disease can cause it there's a variety of different conditions perioperative inadvertent hyperthermia so around the anesthetic period of any kind of surgery or anesthetic procedure regardless of surgery or not and of course inadvertent it's not on purpose and so body temperatures will go down because when you sedate an animal they no longer can control their their, their mechanisms of control are not as, as optimal and then of course environmental they're just outside in the cold those are your, your three broad categories it, and anyone's never seen an anesthesia machine, this is a pretty basic one uh, for use in dogs. I'm not really sure of the incidence of hypothermia when it comes to disease because it's any disease and so it just kind of depends on the condition itself. The same way I'm not, I, I couldn't find any studies on what the frequency of environmental hypothermia is. I just, I don't know the numbers on those things. Perioperative intervertin is very common because we perform a lot of procedures on dogs under anesthesia and sedation, and so we have plenty of data on that. Slight hypothermia is seen in about half of the dogs, moderate, uh, and about a third, severe, 2.8%. Then after surgery and recovery, 88%. The biggest reason for morbidity and mortality after an anesthetic procedure is postoperative hypothermia. So we put a lot of stress in the veterinary hospital for getting those patients warmed up as quickly as possible, especially the more debilitated ones, older ones, smaller ones certain species. So most of this talk is going to be based on anesthetic reasons for hypothermia and how we combat that because I don't have a lot of data on the other stuff. Rather, the disease data would be insane. That's a lot of diseases. And the environmental one, I just don't have the numbers on. So when you look at factors, like what causes hypothermia in, in dogs under sedation? Well, in general, sedating them or anesthetizing them is a reason. The longer you have them under sedation and anesthesia, the more likely you're going to be hypothermic. And of course, shaving the hair because you lose that insulation. Those are all factors for having hypothermia. When you look at the uh, ASA, physical stat status classification, this determines what the level of risk is for any given patient undergoing anesthesia, both human and non-human. And so the higher the risk factor, the more severe the hypothermia will be or the risk of getting hypothermia will be. And that makes sense. The more debilitated you are, the more sick you are, the more traumatized you are, and now you're undergoing anesthesia, the higher the risk you have for having, uh, for having complications. So this, this is a, a pretty common chart that we'll use. ASA1 would be healthy patients. Those that are at six are declared brain dead. Organs are being removed for donor purposes and everything in between. So obviously the higher you are on this, on this scale, the more likely you are to suffer from hypothermia in the pre-anesthetic period all with sedation and anesthesia. Other factors associated with whether or not you're at risk of getting hypothermia, and I don't know if this, if this relates to you guys in the field or not uh, doing this stuff, but if they're in sternal position, so they're like Superman, or they're on their back, dorsal position, they are more likely to become hypothermic than if you have them on their side. Again, this is all under sedation and anesthesia. So whether or not this applies to, to you, I'm not sure, but position matters as well. So perhaps if you're trying to recover a dog from having hypothermia, having them on their side is gonna be a bit better than having them on their back or on their stomachs. And this, this probably, by the way, is probably more of like a surface area thing with the recumbency. So um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the exact reason for it, but I, I, I presume that uh, less of the dog's body is exposed, I guess, when, when they're on their side versus when they're on their back or their stomach. And also we know that dogs have less hair on their stomach, so maybe that's another reason why in that position. And I don't know whether cardiovascularly there's a reason why this happens, but that's what we, that's what we know about it. Other inciting factors, we know that smaller patients are more likely to get hypothermia. They have usually less body fat, so they, they, they dissipate heat uh, at a larger rate. Um, any surgery for neurologic or orthopedic disease, these are probably because these procedures involve not just uh, blood loss, but also they are the longer procedures as well. They're usually coupled with having preoperative and postoperative diagnostics. So not only are they in anesthesia for the surgery, but they already got x-rays and CAT scan MRI beforehand, and they got the same testing afterwards. They're on anesthesia for a long time. MRI procedures in general tend to be very long because in animals we have to have them under anesthesia for MRIs, unlike in people where you can be awake for them. And then of course certain drugs that we use for anesthesia can cause their blood pressure to go down and, and then you have hypothermia because of poor perfusion.
protective factors. So uh, what are ways to try and protect these dogs from development hypothermia? Uh, body temperature before pre-medicating them. So there was, there was a study that looked at trying to like, pre-warm these dogs. What if you warmed them, for t warmed them for 20 or 30 minutes in an incubator and then knocked them out for anesthesia? And that didn't seem to really help much. So, which makes sense, because I mean, the body, body ability to regulate temperature is gonna happen like in the moment. It's, you can't really preemptively you know, warm for that. Um, but anyway, so then uh, body surface plays a role. This is the big patients versus smaller patients. Environmental temperature obviously plays a role active warming efforts. So there have been studies that looked at like placing socks on animals during anesthesia. Here's a picture of, of a dog with a, a heating blanket and then, then the, the uh, bear hugger. So this is a, this is a, a balloon-like sack that fills with hot air. It's connected to a machine that you basically turn on different levels and it'll, it'll uh, inflate with warm air. And then there's ones that are made like for the operating room. There are heating tables for the operating room as well. All measures that we that we use to prevent hypothermia. Bit busy slide here, but it's all the it's all the pathophysiology behind it. So, if they either have abnormal pharmacokinetics, so their body already doesn't metabolize drugs normally, then sedation and anesthetic drugs are going to remain in their body for a lot longer. They're going to be limiting them less. Um, converting them to metabolites that are excreted less because the metabolism will slow down because of low temperature or because of disease rather or if they have low temperature already then their body isn't going to metabolize drugs at the normal rate that a healthy non normal thermic dog or cat would you're going to see organ system dysfunction similar to hypothermia and heat stroke where it's going to affect the entire body so we see a decrease in cardiac output by 80 percent and uh, blood, blood flow decreased by 60%. This is just, these are the formulas we use to measure blood pressure and cardiac output. The point is, if you have an abnormality in something, so for example, blood pressure is the cardiac output multiplied by systemic vascular resistance. Well, if you have a lower cardiac output, which we do in these animals, then you end up affecting the, low pre the, the blood pressure by, by driving it down. Another example is when we were dealing with heat stroke in dogs, when they're in shock, their systemic vascular resistance goes down. The, two, the, the, the vasculature, the tubes that hold blood flow are now dilated. And if you have a dilation, you don't get that resistance. You don't have the resistance that literally will lower blood pressure. And so in heat stroke, this is the, the problem there. And in hypothermia, cardiac output is a problem. And then cardiac output is measured by heart rate times stroke volume. So heart rate, how fast the heart contracting. Stroke volume is with every single heart contraction, how much blood goes out. And, and if you affect one or both of these factors, you're gonna have a problem with cardiac output. And of course we see cardiac output is decreased in these dogs. So um, heart rate goes down in dogs that are hypothermic. They're more prone to infection. Oh, this is kind of, this is questionable, debatable, but in general, we tend to think that dogs that have low body temperature are more likely to get infection. And the reason why this is debatable is because, so if you've ever been in an operating room before, it's very cold in there. They keep the temperatures low. And because warmer temperatures tend to breed bacteria, and so we lower them. And so, but you're also combating the patient's body because they're already under anesthesia, so they lose all the thermal regulation, and now you've lowered their room temperature, so hypothermia is a problem. So you're balancing those two things. So we choose to go more towards hypothermia, or rather colder environments, risking hypothermia, or at least trying to prevent it from happening or treating it at the moment. There's that balance there. Reduced wound healing is thought to occur in these dogs that have hypothermia. Again, we're back to forming clots. They, they uh, um, have a slower clot formation. All the clot themselves is good. They make them at a slower rate. Low blood pressure, so hypotension, which we talked about here. Delayed anesthetic recovery. Hypothermic dogs are gonna take longer to get out of anesthesia and be awake. More surgical, com surgical complications and of course death. So prevention, um, a study looked at using a heat and moisture exchanger in dogs that were less than 10 kgs for MRIs and they didn't find there was much change with the risk of hypothermia there. This is the incubator study I mentioned. So putting them in an incubator uh, for about 20 minutes prior to anesthesia. They did have a higher temperature afterwards but they didn't have any changes in shivering and there was no change in extubation nor any improved recovery temperature from anesthesia. So uh, maybe it helped a little bit but you know, if, if, if you're ending surgery at a better hypothermia, it's still hypothermia, and so this doesn't seem really very useful. 
no effect when we have IV fluid warming or uh, and or forced warm air. So this is interesting because we use this very commonly at the vet hospitals. And, it, 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 and I always thought it was kind of inefficient because you're with IV fluid warming. So if you imagine you have an IV pump, the tube going to the dog, you're heating up the bag or maybe the IV line and the bag. By the time it gets there, the heat's dissipated already. So it's so we it's maybe more of we do for ourselves to feel good about ourselves, but clearly there's no effect. Um, incubator, or so this is a let's see. So this incubator is lower temperature and. I don't know the difference in size of dogs, but this is for a longer period of time and there was no change in, in body temperature. If you use forced air, forced air warmer, so for example, that bear hugger that I showed you before, that sack that fills with hot air, if you don't use it and you just let the dogs recover, they get normal temperature in seven and a half hours. If you use it, if you use the forced air warmer, 75% of dogs will recover in about three and a half hours. So you know, about half the time is pretty good. Using blankets and things don't really help. Then um, another study looked at using an amino acid solution with fluids. Again, this is in the hospital setting. Um, it did attenuate decreased temperatures in dogs. It shortened the extubation time. The time it takes for the, the doctor or the nurse to remove the tube and tracheal tube from the dog's mouth was shorter, less shivering. So solutions like this might help. This is not warming the solutions. This is giving them extra electrolytes and amino acids to help the body recover. This was the, one, the only study that I found that actually showed improvements with uh, hypothermia. If you wrap them up in bubble wrap and down cloth blankets during the procedure, that got them better. And that makes sense. You're trying to just retain heat. That's really the goal with hypothermia. You're trying to prevent it from happening. Again, keeping in mind, of course, this is all anesthetics. This is kind of planned. We know what's going to happen in the field. You, you, you would check the body temperature. So um, always check body temperature. So if you think a dog has hypothermia, check a temperature, document that the temperature is low. If it is low, start warming them. And you can access to the veterinarian, to the veterinarian as you're trying to warm them. Uh, what I mentioned earlier with the burning, because you mentioned the, the cooling uh, vests, if, if you're trying, if you have a bear hugger, you have a heating pad, and you're trying to warm up the dog, um, or any animal type, but the, you want to make sure you have a layer of protection between the skin and that heating pad, because those dogs are going to be in a hypothermic state. They're not going to be as mental, mentally sharp. They're not going to respond to stuff, and they will they will get heat burns uh, after the fact. You won't they won't tell you, and so just make sure you have a protective layer between between the dog and the, the heating blanket. But again, if you're in the field, do what you got to do to warm up the temperature. I mean, that's and uh, that's it. Yeah, so this is my contact information again. QR code for my company. Any questions? Yes? You, you mentioned that the opioid access. Um, one of the things that we're doing with all of our dogs is all of our handlers are carrying Narcan or don't start carrying Narcan mm -hmm. for the dog. Um, if they do get exposed, because we live in the fentanyl capital of the world, mm -hmm. uh, if they do get exposed, would you suggest me putting on there, hey, check your temperature as well just to make sure that it's not going back to the Yes, yes. The question is, we have a dog that gets into some drugs, and I want to use a reversal for that drug. Um, should I check the body temperature at that moment? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely check it. Yes, yes. Now, um, I've, I've worked with a, in New York, I worked with the DEA and give them talks on like ketamine and things like that for their dogs. And I gave them a, a wallet size, I should have brought some. I gave them a wallet size chart on like what dosing of these drugs to give dogs to recover from, from drug exposure. Um, and so it seems that if you, if you know they got exposed, like you know they're exposed to drugs, then of course do what you gotta do to reverse it if you have the reversal capabilities. But as far as abnormal body temperature regulation, yeah, always check the, the body before you start implementing treatment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they're hypothermic because they got into drugs, I would still reverse the drug. You know, I would still give them the Narcan, but um, then you have to also systematically treat the side effects. Well, we all we all carry uh, nasal Narcan, mm -hmm. and so they're going to give them a four milligram nasal. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. I don't know if that's too much or too little. No, so so um um from the study that I did on that, I didn't see any complications with like over administering that drug, and I can't remember what my calculations were. That was this years ago that I did this, but uh, if that's what works, that's what works. We um you have to do something because they're they're obviously yeah debilitated so. But it's it's more that if you know they have an abnormal, if you suspect an abnormal body temperature, and you're able to check it, then check it while you're trying to treat them at the same time for all this stuff. Yeah. 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 And, and nasal administration of any drug is going to be slower than intravenous, of course, right? So you have like time to. It's not like it's 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 a right then and there. You have to
time to sort of give the drug and get the temperature, reassess, and see from there. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. All right, thank you.